Hello, I'm Lukas Krenz. And on behalf of my colleagues, I'm presenting elastic acoustic coupling for large-scale earthquake simulations. Here is a list of selected collaborations, which are all connected to the content of this talk. So we at TUM develop the software, and we collaborate with the seismological groups of the LMU, now it's Scripps, Stanford and University of Helsinki. And we've got funding from uh, various sources. The most important one here for me is the Center of Excellence in Solid Earth. So this talk is all about um, doing fully coupled simulations. Um, on the left, you see the old approach for earthquake tsunami workflows. People first run a 3D earthquake model, which outputs the seafloor displacement, which is then used as input for a 2D tsunami model. On the right, you can see our proposed workflow. We have one model that can handle both earthquake and tsunami. Everything is in 3D here and we only require one single model run. So how do these two approaches compare? Um, so if you use the shallow water equations, so any 2D solver for tsunamis, you incur some disadvantages. Firstly, you do not model dispersive effects unless using Businesk approximation. You have no acoustic waves in the model because the shallow water equations assume that the ocean is incompressible. This is not directly relevant for the tsunami because it doesn't really have a huge impact on this. However, if you compare to measurements, especially from offshore instruments, the acoustic waves can actually be dominant there. Hence, if you compare to measurements, you actually want to have these acoustic waves there. And finally, they only work in shallow water. Hence, our proposed fully coupled model solves an entirely new class of earthquake tsunami problems. And under certain conditions, we compare well with the standard one-way linking model, but we have more physical effects that we model. For more details, you can find a detailed model comparison in the paper from Abrahams and others, which also use our software as a reference model. The first scenario that I want to talk about is the Palo Sulawesi earthquake tsunami, September 2018. It was a magnitude 7.5 strike slip earthquake which propagated at super sheer speed, which crossed the narrow Palo Bay. It was followed by an unexpected and localized tsunami. It was unexpected because earthquakes of this type typically don't generate tsunamis. On the right, you can see a snapshot of the vertical sea surface velocity and of the simulation domain. The epicenter is denoted by the star. The black lines denote the fault zone. And on the bottom of the map, you have actually Palu. This is now is further interesting because of complicated geometry. It has a bathtub-like bay, which is very shallow water, which is roughly 600 meters. It means it's very hard to actually get a geometrical setup for this. We've written down the details of the setup in our SC paper from 2021, cited on this slide. For all shown scenarios, we use and develop the seismic wave propagation and earthquake dynamics solver SISOL. It has a lot of features. Every feature that we're using is written here in boldface. So for our setups, we're using isotropic elastic wave propagation, which models the Earth. We use acoustic wave propagation to model the ocean. We have off fault plasticity in the Earth, and the earthquake itself is driven by dynamic earthquake rupture. SISO does this all with a high order in both time and space to make a method, A to the G, and it works on unstructured tetrahedral meshes. We use local time stepping to facilitate efficient simulations. Everything is done in optimized hybrid MPI and OpenMP parallelization, so we have a quite efficient software. And best of all, it's available as open source software on GitHub. We use the linear acoustic wave equation to simulate the ocean. It's treated as a special case of the elastic wave equation with no shear waves and hence a collapsing stress tensor into the pressure. The free surface physically says that the pressure at x, y, eta, where eta is the sea surface height, should be zero. This is typically solved by a moving mesh. 
However, this is very expensive. And hence, following the approach from Lotto and Dunham in 2015, we linearized this boundary condition using the hydrostatic background to a pressure condition on the unperturbed sea surface x, y, set equals zero. And we just set the pressure there to rho density times g, gravitational acceleration, times eta. We also need to keep track of eta, which is a second local ODE. In this approach, we can track the sea surface very efficiently without a moving mesh. Now, the Palo setup, a few more details. What we did is basically we added a water layer to an existing already published and verified model by Ulrich and others in 2019. We used a fully coupled model. This means we include plasticity, the Nick earthquake rupture, and wave propagation in both earth and ocean. Everything in 3D, of course. And we also have wave propagation on the surface, which means we can model tsunamis. We created two meshes, one M mesh with 89 million elements and the large mesh L with 518 million elements. By using a polynomial order of five, which leads to a convergence order of six in both time and space, the resulted in 46 and 261 billion degrees of freedom. So the large mesh is the largest model that we ever ran. For the MS, we ran this for 100 seconds in a time, which is enough to capture the tsunami, more or less, on 1,000 nodes of SuperMOOC and Qi, and it ran in 5.3 hours. We only ran the LMS for 30 seconds, which is enough to capture the entirety of the earthquake uh, propagation, and enough to have the beginning of tsunami propagation. This took 5.5 hours on 3,072 nodes of SuperMOOC and Qi. In the right, you can see the resulting setup. Uh, the gray line is default. And you can see that because we have a super shift speed, we actually have some kind of Mach cone uh, trailing behind it. Here's a view of our fully coupled simulation of the L mesh at 15 seconds. Uh, what's shown here is the gray line again is default. We can see the earthquake rupture front uh, in the beginning. And trailing behind this, we have the Mach cone. We can see Palo Bay. The water layer is noted by the black lines. And we show the uh, vertical velocity in the, on the ocean and the slip rate on the fault. You can see that it's actually quite a complicated result. And we actually have a very finely resolved um, velocity field. <clears throat> Furthermore, we have, you can see that we have topography in the model. Finally, let me show the comparison with one-way linking. So on the left, we have the one-way linking, which is the reference model. and the right, we have our proposed fully coupled model. Both use the same earthquake model, but a different tsunami model. For the fully coupled model, we use the, well, we have fully coupled models. We didn't need to use any specific model. In one way linking, we use a standard shallow water equation solver. Here shown is the sea surface displacement between 1 and 100 seconds. We can see that both models have a pretty similar result. There is some difference, however, at the coast, and the tsunami is a bit smoother in our case. We are currently working on actually determining where this difference comes from. The last slide for this uh, model is about the strong scaling on Sumung and Qi. For us important is the red line. The x-axis shows the number of nodes and the y-axis shows the gigaflops per node. So this is basically parallel efficiency. And we can see that we scale the mesh with 8 million elements relatively well between 50 and 1600 nodes. The larger mesh of course scales better. We're also good at the weak scaling. I want to show you here that uh, when you run the model on 1000 nodes, we actually get quite good performance. The second example that I want to talk about is the Autonomy project, which is an enhanced geothermal system in Helsinki. It was stimulated in June and July 2018 and led to thousands of induced small earthquakes. So these earthquakes are unavoidable in ETS. 
They are typically not dangerous, but they can be quite annoying. To quote one person, it was a big blast followed by a long 10 second echo. This is one of many observations of crowd shaking and audible disturbances collected by the macroseismic questionnaire of the Institute of Seismology at the University of Helsinki. More details about this can be found in our preprint. Let's reference on the slide. On the right you can see the simulation domain in black. It's a part of the city of Helsinki and the city of Espo. So a few more details. Um, on the left you can see the uh, area around the epicenter. So the earthquake source is denoted by this star. The Red line is the borehole, which is not, not directly vertical, but slightly horizontal. Um, and every dot on the left is one induced earthquake in 2018. So there are quite a few earthquakes. And we focus on the largest one, which is the 1.8 earthquake, uh, which again is loaded by the, uh, by the star. On the right, you can see um, the same region is zoomed out a bit. Um, and you can see the every dot here is a complaint about either sound or shaking or sound and shaking. So if it's filled with gray, you have sh shaking. If there's a black border around the circle, you have sound. If you have both, you have sound and shaking. So there are quite a lot of complaints. And this is uh, what's basically what's driven our, our modeling efforts. So what we did is we created maps. Um, so on the, the first map is the horizontal peak ground velocity. So this gives a measurement of how fast the Earth moves in the horizontal direction. This is a very important metric because this is uh, mostly codif codified in building codes. You often have the situation that a building has to sustain a certain PGV. Um, you can see here that we are in the millimeter per second range, so that's not really a large earthquake. Um, in these maps also we have the uh, observations again of sound uh, and sound and shaking, the latter one which is in black. You can see the complaints actually are very much aligned with the PGV. Uh, then we have three columns for the SPL, which is the sound pressure level, which we reconstructed by um, a calibrated method from the peak vertical velocity. We also ran, of course, fully coupled models, but this SPL that's shown here is a reconstruction, which has a bit of a better um, resolution in space. You see here that uh, in the SPL, again, the complaints come from the region where we have a la larger sound pressure level. Um, in the second last rows, we have um, the sound pressure level separated into both waves. We have the P wave, which arrives earlier, but is typically of a lesser magnitude. We have the S wave, which is larger, but also slower. And it's interesting because typically people assume that the P wave drives the sound. However, in our case, we can see that the S wave drives the sound generation mostly. Um, To conclude, I've shown fully coupled models for both um, tsunamis and sound generation. Um, our fully coupled models capture more effects than typical one-way linking strategies. So they can be a reference model. By linearizing the free surface boundary condition, we have an efficient way of tracking the sea surface height. We see some differences in the pilot tsunami because we more or less have a smoother tsunami. And this difference will be actually quite important when connecting tsunami observations with an active area of research. I've shown a further application that's modeling sound generated by induced earthquakes. And you can see that we have as an outlook also in the pipeline, well, our colleagues have fully coupled models for the Mediterranean tsunami and for the Husavik Flatley's fault zone in North Iceland. And there are more to come. And that concludes what I have to say. Thank you.